Thank you very much, Hannah, and it's a great pleasure to be here and also to be invited to uh, the Innovation and Engagement Lecture um, in the School of Planning and Geography. I had a researcher who was working with me on a previous project where we were looking at drinking water across the world. Um, and the researcher came from here originally and then returned here. His name is Adrian Evans. And he always said that really I, he thought I was a bit of a geographer. And I think he meant that as a, as a compliment, as a form of flattery. And I, um, but uh, anyway, you'll, you'll see whether I really am a geographer and whether I merit the name um, from this uh, lecture that I'm going to give. So I think I ought to just... Um, have a few words about the, the title and what I'm going to, uh, to be talking about. I mean, the title is really uh, suggesting that issues of climate change need to move away from thinking in terms of anthropogenic uh, uh, climate change, which, which suggests that really it's just the sum of all human activity which is causing, uh, which is causing uh, climate change and is a risk to an idea of sociogenesis, and by that I mean that there are very different political economies in the world that are, have very different consequences in terms of uh, the, the generation of climate change. So we, I, I want to make an argu a broad argument that we need to move away from thinking about anthropogenic cli climate change to thinking about sociogenic climate change. And then the other kind of main thing about the title is to think that uh, is, is an argument which says that the political economies of capitalism today face two unprecedented challenges. One is climate change, certainly, and the other one is confronting a number of, uh, of constraints on finite resources. And the three ones that I will be focusing on in this, in, uh, in, in this lecture are um, obviously energy, fossil energy, uh, land and, uh, and, and, um, and water. So this particular combination of food, energy and climate change has, has been referred to as the food, energy, climate change trilemma. And the reason for this is that these, these demands for food, increasing food production, are themselves developing huge risks in terms of climate change and also a competition for land. And that competition for land is exacerbated by the fact that in terms of replacing fossil energy with renewable energy, there are, uh, is a shift towards biofuels and various forms of biomass. So bio, the, the demand for replacing fossil fuels with some forms of renewable energy is also intensifying a competition, a competition for land. So you have this kind of twin twin problem of, uh, of energy and food putting additional pressures on land which in turn exacerbate issues of climate change. So this is the kind of complex notion of a trilemma which is the one I'm going to be, uh, be uh, exploring. And uh, so I'll, I'll be coming back to, to, to uh, talk about that in general throughout, throughout this lecture. But I suppose one of the most important things I think that needs to be emphasized is that, that I think both in social science but also in policy circles, there has been a, a, an under-recognition of the significance of the use of land for agriculture uh, in, uh, in particular as one of the most important sources for greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, if you look at the figures, it's the, the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions from the current uses of land and the conversion of non-agricultural land into agricultural land is something like two and a half times greater than total global transport. So it is a very, a very significant uh, aspect in terms of, um, in terms of uh, understanding, understanding the dynamics of, of, of climate change. Okay, so I've talked a bit um, about the title and therefore why I'm focusing on the climate change and finitudes of resources, the importance of land and food. I'm going to have a, a very brief section about the uh, economic sociology approach that I adopt. I'm not going to go into any depth because I, I, I know that there are probably not too many economic sociologists in, in the audience and so I will, I'll just be framing it in the most general way. And then I'm going to go into 
what I'd describe as the very long view, which comes from uh, somebody called Rudderman, which is looking really right back into thousands of years of, 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 uh, of human history to, to look at climate change in relation to uh, land use, uh, climate change in relation to land use. And then I'm going to go into a shorter but still pretty long-term view by looking at the period of the Industrial Revolution, because I think that has in a way been seriously misread in terms of its significance for, uh, for global climate change. Then I'm going to take us right up to the kind of current uh, position where I, I'm going to revisit and go through what I understand about the climate change as represented by natural sciences and environmental sciences. And we're going to argue that in order to get away from an anthropogenic view, we need to look at particular trajectories of political economies. And so I'm going to take as an example Brazil and the development of Brazil over actually what is really quite a historically short term, so roughly from the 1980s to, to uh, 1970s to, to the present. And I, I'm going to therefore look at, at this particular Brazilian trajectory as an example of how the trilemma evolves differently in different parts of the world and is driven differently by different political economies. And then I'll sum up. So in my Neoplanian approach, I, I start off with a, a, an idea, a particular anthropological idea of what an economy is, and I'm not going to go into that at all here, only to say that the economy is in Polanyian, and I'm talking about Karl Polanyi now. Some of you might know Karl Polanyi. He's very famous for his book, The Great Transformation. Uh, I actually rely much more on his later anthropo economic anthropo anthropology work. But he, he, and he had a particular anthropological understanding of the economy as articulated as dis a distinct sphere of society, but one which is embedded in society in relation to law, the polity, culture. So economy is placed very much within the society and can only be understood in, within the, the social context and also in terms of all the interactions between culture and economy, polity and economy, law and economy. And so it can never be understood uh, in terms of how it develops as a kind of completely separate sphere, as you might find in some sort of classical economics and uh, uh, so it's, it's a particular kind of take on how the place, what, what, what Polanyi called the place of economy in society and the shifting place of the economy in society, in different societies. But then having put the economy in society, society in it then needs to be placed in its natural environmental context. So the interaction between society and, uh, the, uh, and its economy has to be understood within its particular uh, envir environmental context. It's access to resources, it's use of resources, uh, uh, and so on. So the economy is, needs to be seen very much in, in terms of its development, in terms of the way that it interacts with, with, with nature. And that's why this approach, I think, is very useful in broad terms for uh, understanding the development of the food, energy, uh, climate change trilemma. And so uh, if, you, if you think, if you, if you take that kind of model of society being placed within a natural environment, it's actually very different from a lot of the understandings that there have been in terms of the crisis that is faced in terms of climate change. If you go back to the very famous uh, 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 Rome group and their book on the limits of growth, it was about how human activity as a whole was meeting limits to growth in terms of the carrying capacity of the planet. And, that, uh, and this has been a tradition that has actually gone through quite a lot. I don't know, some, some of you might well know uh, the, the planetary boundaries, which is a much more contemporary, contemporary view of resilience theory, where you meet certain boundaries in terms of you go beyond a certain point of, of, of where, uh, uh, of uh, of a comfort zone for human, of, of human space within the environment. So if you, if you emit too much CO2 and go across a certain threshold, then you place a, a huge risk uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of climate change. If you go um, 
beyond uh, a, a certain level, you will deplete the ozone layer. Or if you go beyond a certain level of destruction of biodiversity, you can suddenly reach a tipping point where there are uh, ecological catastrophes and widespread destruction of whole, uh, of whole ecosystems. So all of this, though, is framed very much in terms of of, of total aggregate human activity. And it's not, really, it's not really looked at in terms of where and how this is happening in different social and political contexts of, uh, in, in, uh, across, the, across the world. And you, you'll see later on why uh, I'm making this emphasis on, on this point. But against the limits to growth um, argument and the planetary boundaries argument, there has been a big counter argument that was faced, particularly, which was promoted particularly in innovation studies where there was, uh, the, the, uh, and it's a view where, that, that, that human history has always confronted these kind of boundaries. But due to the capacity for human beings' uh, limitless ability to create technological solutions or social solutions, there, are always put, there, there, are, there isn't such a thing as a total... As, as a physical limit or a, 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 a resource, an absolute resource limit. And even if you think of something like solar energy, if we could, if we could use solar energy instead of fossil energy, well, solar energy will run out eventually, but actually for, not for the, in, in the kind of time frame that we need to be too concerned about at the moment. So, so it's, it, you could imagine, uh, you can imagine uh, there being uh, innovation, new technologies which are capable of harnessing solar energy in ways that have never been imagined before. I mean, we can see kind of incipient uh, uh, the start of these kind of in innovation uh, uh, strategies with things like solar panels. And the, uh, this, this view has been put forward by uh, Sokolow and Pekulov, saying that you can find stabilization wedges. You can stabilize the crisis. You can mitigate climate change. You can, you can prevent biodiversity from being uh, catastrophic and so on. So there's, there's that kind of view uh, that has been, as I say, at the level of what I call the anthropogene, the, the, hu the, hu the total human population. And within um, political ecology and resource geography, there is also, not, not such a kind of completely undifferentiated concept of, of, of climate, uh, of, uh, of, the, um, of the interaction between human society and, and, and its, its planetary environment. But in, it, it's, a, it's nonetheless a very kind of universalistic one. Um, it's an idea that uh, capitalism is, is a single phenomenon across the world, and that over the last 20 or 30 years, we've got a, a neoliberal version of it. And this neoliberal version of it is one which there is completely unconstrained general commodification of nature and the, the introduction of, uh, of, uh, of, the profit, of the profit motive into every single space that is, is available. And I, it has the ideas of a, a deregulated capitalism, where there aren't any constraints on, on, uh, on the amount of environmental damage that is caused, for example. And, it, and it's a, this idea of deregulated, marketized, uh, uh, and universal commodification of nature. So this is an idea of a neoliberal capitalism, which is completely running riot across the whole of the world in a fairly hom hom homogeneous, homogeneous and undifferentiated way. It's been widely criticized. As being, as, as being too, too universalistic. But nonetheless, it's a kind of been quite a common strand uh, of, of, of thinking in, in political ecology and resource geography. So, and it's against this, these two kind of strands that I'm really wanting to talk about multiple political economy trajectories in different resource environments. And I'm going to use the example of Brazil, but you could take the USA, you could take countries in Europe, you could take China, and I will be hinting about the different varieties that there are and the different trajectories that there are and how these are important in understanding uh, the, the development of the trilemma issues. Okay, so now I'm going to very rapidly go through uh, uh, 
what is the very, the very long view, and here it is really primarily just to emphasize the significance of agriculture as, as, contributory, to, as contri contributory to global climate change. And I'm taking the, the work essentially of, of Ruderman here, and he, he, he uh, uh, brought together the kind of um, summarized really the, the evidence of the effect of first things like forest clearance. So if you look at these, this, that's 7,000 years ago, that's 1850, so well before the Industrial Revolution, the bulk of the, 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 the majority of forest, forest clearance had already occurred. And we do know that forest clearance is a very source, an important source of greenhouse gas emissions. And then if you look at uh, carbon dioxide parts per million, you can see that already by 1850, there had been a, a very significant amount, although very much slower in, in terms of its, of its progression, a, a rapid acceleration after 1850, but nonetheless, a very significant rise in the level of, uh, of, uh, of CO2 um, by, that, by that time. And his argument about that is that this can be, uh, can be best explained by uh, the domestication of crops, the emergence of, of, uh, of early forms of agriculture. And in fact, his own work in particular looked at ice cores uh, and uh, the, the, the traces of gases in ice cores going back thousands and thousands of years. And one of the most significant of these was the development of methane em emissions and the methane, the presence of methane in the ice cores. Uh, going again right back to 5,000 year, 5, years ago. And methane is, a, I mean, the argument is, I mean, it's, it is, it's not uncon uncontroversial, but the argument is that, uh, that rice cultivation started to really expand at around that kind of period of time. And there's a lot of archaeological evidence about the extent of rice cultivation at that time. I mean, we've heard a lot about how cows and uh, and uh, animals of all kinds emit methane, but rice is a very important source of methane, uh, methane gas emissions. And methane is 20 times more powerful as a, as a, as a warming gas than CO2. So this figure here of, of the growth of methane is a very significant one. And, and, um, so this, and this figure just shows the relationship between population, growth of uh, uh, sedentary, sedentary, sedentary ag agriculture and the domestication of crops. So this is the very, the very, very long view. But now I want to go to a much, come, we're going fast forwarding through history now and, uh, and I'm, I'm referring to what I think is, has been a very significant book by Kenneth Pomerantz called The Great Divergence. I have to say about the book, it, it, I mean, the book is essentially saying that at the time of the uh, late, late 18th century, there, there was the, the conditions for an industrial revolution and an industrial relation to take off were at least as present in, in China, in parts of South China, as they were in, uh, in, in, in Northern Europe. And indeed, they were, uh, uh, Japan and parts of India also had, had very similar conditions. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but the argument is that, they, that there, there has to be a, a different kind of explanation as to why the Industrial Revolution took place, where it did, and when it did. And his central, one of his central arguments were that it was to do with finitudes of land and energy resources in the 18th century. And essentially his argument was that what, what enabled urbanization and the growth of industry was not only the presence of cheap coal and easily of the right kind of coal, in, in particular in England, but also that it was a period where there had been a, a, a great escape from the finitudes of land resources in Northern Europe. So it was the move for colonization and particularly the growth of plantation economies in the New World, which released Europe from the constraints of land, of, of land and therefore the ability to produce, uh, uh, produce food and clothing and, uh, uh, that was, was significant in, in, uh, in, 
explaining why, why, uh, why the, it was possible for there to be an industrial revolution. It was one of the major facilitating uh, aspects of it. And so during this period, and again, so one knows that climate change was produced by burning coal, for sure. I mean, that's very important, obviously, in the growth of factory factory industry in, in, in Northern Europe and, and parts of North America were very important. But at the same time, during this period from 1760 to 1890, the amount of land under cultivation in the world grew by 466%. So in a very, very short period of time, land that had been non-agriculture, agricultural, was transformed into agricultural land. And if anybody has looked at the recent debates and controversies about land use change and its significance for greenhouse ga gas emissions, well, you've got to think that this, this very rapid exchange, uh, uh, very rapid growth of expansion of the area of agricultural land was, was of, huge, of huge importance. And so it was calculated that uh, for, just for England alone, effectively, uh, there were 30 million ghost acres of land. And what did this ghost acres mean? Well, it means that instead of having to rely on flax or, or sheep in England to clothe the people of England, the growth of cotton production in the southern United States especially enabled the whole of the population to be clothed with cotton fabric, cotton textiles, in a way which released, as it were, the constraints of, being a, of, being, of clothing people from, from, from within the territory of the ter land territory of England. So when one thinks of the Industrial Revolution and climate change, you need to think of coal, cotton and sugar. It's not one or the other, it's the combination of the three which is really, really significant. Um, and in a way, you can see what Pomerantz was talking about, and he didn't look at, about, look at it in this way at all. This is my take on it. Uh, that in a way, this, the Industrial Revolution was a particular emergence of a, a distinctive North European trilemma trajectory involving food and the, the huge new sources of, of calories in sugar in particular that was coming from the, from the, the slave plantation economies. Um, Energy, certainly, the, the sources of coal, uh, and, and, also, uh, and also clothing. So you have a, a particular set of finitudes of, of resources within, New, 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 uh, within Nor Northern Europe, which were then suddenly transformed by the expansion of Europe into the, the New World. So it was the burning coal, plus land use change, which was the essential driver of, of that sudden upturn in greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, from 1850 onwards. So when you look, <coughs> as some of you may do, at um, a particular genre of movie, uh, you, you really need to look at it with slightly new eyes. <laughs> Okay, so now I want to really come up to the present day and, and talk about the trilemma in the most general sense in the way that environmental science would think about it. And I'll try to, and do this quite rapidly. Um, for those that are you interested, it's, uh, it's explained more fully in, a, in, a, uh, in the Food Policy Journal article. So here we're facing a, a, a situation where there's increased and changing food demand. Uh, and the general assumption is that the world population is going to grow from roughly 6 billion now to about 9 billion in, in 2050. And most people, most demographers now think it's going to plateau at around that, around that kind of figure of, of 9 billion. And, and of course, we've also got very significant changing food demand. So, uh, in particular, people have talked uh, about the, uh, this is a horrible word, meatification of diet in, 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 Chi in Southeast Asia and, and in particular in China. Uh, and of course, this increase, of, uh, increase in changing de food demand places huge, huge 
uh, demands on changing land use and uh, expanding la land use. Then we've, we've got what has been called peak oil. Of increased, there's been increased energy and materials demand, but there is petrochemical resource depletion. And when I first started working about this, uh, on this, there was actually a lot of talk about peak oil. And, and US, for example, in terms of conventional oil, reached its peak production in the 1970s, early 1970s. Um, I'll come back to the fact that the, the goalposts have been shifted with fracking and non-conventional oil, but nonetheless, we are dealing with a fact that there are, whatever the particular twists and turns, there are physical, physical constraints in the amount of oil that there is in the world. I will go on to say that, it is, in my mind, the problem is always to characterize it as a global resource. It's very important where the oil is, where the fracking can take place. Not every, not every country, the Netherlands, for example, hasn't got the capacity to find fracked gas in the way that the US has. Where, where the oil is matters very, very significantly for the way that any political economy will with development. You can't understand the oil economies of the Middle East without thinking that the fact that they are sitting on oil is very significant in the trajectory of development that they have and their particular interaction with their natural environments. So this, this process of petrochemical depletion has driven a look for, uh, for uh, sources of energy, renewable sources, one of which is biomass. And that's partly because, in spite of electric cars, we haven't really found uh, we, a, a solution to, find, uh, 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 to replace liquid fuels for transport, particularly heavy goods vehicle transport over long, uh, over long distances. Nobody's coming up with an electric um, articulated lorry. Uh, th there is still an issue of, of, uh, of, of, of finding a renewable energy replacement for, pe uh, for, for, for oil. And, and obviously the same goes for uh, uh, air traffic as well. So this, this uh, petrochemical uh, depletion has put pressure on f uh, the development of alternative sources of energy, and that again then has part of this pincer movement in terms of a new competition for land use between bioenergy and, uh, uh, bio and food. And all of these feed back into climate change, which then in turn affects what land is available to be used, uh, uh, and whether land becomes unutilizable, degraded, or flooded, or, uh, and so on. So there is a, a continual complex process of, 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 of feedback loops that are going on. And this is really what is the kind of nexus, the, uh, the, the, the trilemma nexus of food, energy, and, and, and climate change. But I think the, the important argument that I'm trying to make here is that this needs to be seen much more in terms of different socio-economies generating different trilemmas. So, and I just want to point out how this, this is, uh, how significant this is. So this is just looking at the percent of share of, uh, of CO2 emissions in 2010 in different, in different major countries in the world. And the big contrast here is that in the case of the US, you'll find that under 10% under of that is here, up, right up at this top here, is produced by agriculture and forestry. By far the, the, the bulk of, of their emissions come from energy production and ex, uh, uh, um, extraction and energy, fossil fuel energy use and, and industry. So if that really makes up almost well, over 80% of their total greenhouse gas emissions. And then the real contrast is with Brazil. And I have to stress here that this is not because Brazil is an unindustrialized country. It's not. It's a very highly industrialized country. It has a huge industrial sectors. But then you look at its distinctive carbon, carbon footprint, its, its greenhouse gas footprint. And you'll see here that in terms of energy production and use, it's very, it's hardly, hardly up, up to 30%. The huge bulk of it 
is from agriculture and forestry and changes in, changes in land use. Over, well over 60% of its greenhouse gases come from, from, uh, from, uh, from agriculture and, uh, and land use. And of course, when you think about that, you think about what are the distinctive problems of mitigating about greenhouse gases in Brazil? They're, they have to be completely different. The, the way the trilemma appears in Brazil has to be completely different from the way that it appears in, in the US. So the US, when it looks at its resources, and this is just US petroleum liquids uh, over from 1980 through to 2035, and you'll see that originally they thought there was a kind of peak oil here. And that therefore there were increasing dependence, and it was very noticeable, increasing dependence on Middle, Middle East oil. So when I'm talking about peak oil, I'm, I'll have to emphasize very strongly, and I know in a geography area this is also very important. We're not just talking about it as a physical resource in a particular place. We're talking about the politics and geopolitics of oil. And you'll see why in a minute. So it's not, a, it's not just, it's the relation between states and access to that and the political control of those resources, which is absolutely key. But anyway, so during this very long period, you'll see, you'll see that the US became increasingly dependent on, 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 uh, on uh, imported Middle, Middle East oil until suddenly it discovered this new, whole new area of shale gas and, and tar sands and uh, oil and so on. But if, if you think about this in terms of the historical perspective that I've been talking about, all it is doing is really giving a, a breathing space of what, 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years, before we're back to this point here again. So there's a, there's a term which we use in innovation studies which is, been very well developed by somebody called Anru of, of lock-in. And you can see, in a way, the discovery of this shale, shale gas and the possibility of finding a, suddenly a new source of cheap energy, cheaper energy than is available in Europe, really assists in, in the US locking itself into a trajectory of development that exploits uh, fossil fuel energy and diminishes the pre its pressure to find re renew re renewable sources of energy. But nonetheless, uh, it, 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 has, it, it has chosen and is quite clearly going down a route which is dominated by issues of energy security. There's no consensus about climate change, political consensus about climate change in, in, in the US. And, uh, and it is therefore continues to drive to extract to the maximum any possibility of finding fossil fuel resources. And this contrasts very strongly with the Brazilian trajectory. And, and it's now I want to go and, uh, and talk about the Brazilian tra trajectory. I'm going to have to be very rapid. I'm going to skim over the surface of that. But interestingly, the whole thing really, th th there was an, a, a change in trajectory, a, a point, a critical point in, in the 70s, in 1973 and 1979, where there were the oil price shocks. The oil price shocks affected countries in the south much worse than the countries in the north. Nonetheless, it was at that particular point in time that both North America and Brazil made a decisive shift towards creating, looking for non-fossil fuel liquid fuels and went over to the production of bioethanol from sugar. The distinctive thing, however, was that Brazil stuck to that path. So from that time, for reasons primarily nothing, uh, nothing to do with climate change, but their own energy security, and also not to become indebted by having to import huge quantities of oil at massive cost, they, in, they invested very heavily under a dictatorship, very politically driven, to secure bioethanol from, uh, from sugar cane. So in the, after the second, just as an example, after the second oil shock in 1979, the, 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 the generals uh, um, imposed a 100% uh, ethanol car, bioethanol car, in the, in the Brazilian car market.
So all state cars had to be bioethanol driven, uh, and the, 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 the generals did deals with the major car manufacturers to, to produce 100% ethanol, ethanol fuel cars. It became a kind of a, a state driven form of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of road transport effectively. And car markets, the whole car market was changed. In, after the generals left, there was a, a period where there was a stalling growth of, of, of biofuels in, in, um, in, uh, in, um, in Brazil. The pressure on oil prices had diminished, and there was a more or less plateauing of, of, of the use of, 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 of biofuels. And I suppose what I'm saying here is that this period from 1970 to 1985 is really Brazil addressing one of the horns of the trilemma, the energy security, the peak oil issue, the, the, the constraint on its ac access to global oil. It, it was responding to the, the fossil energy part of the, of the trilemma. So it was looking essentially during this period at, um, at, at, at primarily at energy security. It, it may have been in, in so doing, accidentally being very green and uh, eco ecologically friendly in, in, in doing this. But nonetheless, that wasn't its, poli that weren't its politics at the time. It would be anachronistic to think so. And then in 2000, uh, um, with Lula in, uh, as president, there was, a, a, a gr again, a, a big issues across the world in, uh, in terms of energy security, prices of oil, and uh, Lula negotiated, did a, a much more democratic negotiation with the, with the car manufacturers to produce the fully flex fuel vehicle. And that came into, uh, into production with, again, all the major car manufacturers. It's a fully flex fuel car, so it can run on liquid gas, it can run on petrol, and it can run on bioethanol. And it's, it's more democratic because it really just leaves it to the consumer to look at the price and, uh, and, and worth of each of those fuels. And they can switch from one to the other whenever in response to, in response to pr price. And at the same time, it, became, it took a, a very distinctive political green switch as well because Brazil became a major exporter of bioethanol. It, was confronting a market in, the, in Europe, especially, where there were huge controversies around whether biofuels were green or not. And so they had to produce a form of green certification to prove that ethanol, bioethanol from sugarcane wasn't resulting in the loss of the Amazon, wasn't resulting in deforestation, but was, in fact, a very, uh, a very positive uh, form of, of, of renewable energy in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And I mean, scientifically now, uh, most people uh, would say that Brazilian, Brazilian bioethanol from sugarcane, and particularly the innovations that have occurred in the way that uh, biorefineries work and, and the use of the different use of sugarcane in Brazil, now makes it probably the, the, the most ecologically beneficial form of transport energy that there, that, that there is in, in the world. And it's, it's even more some people have argued that it's even more beneficial than what's called the second generation biofuel, which is uh, biofuels from lignocellulosic material. And then the other, of course, very important aspect about Brazil is that it has, rather than relying on, um, on fossil fuels for, its, uh, for power generation, it's been heavily, it heavily uses hydroelectric power and it's expanding, expanding that. So again, in terms of, in terms of its uh, energy resources, it is using a source of energy which it's very richly endowed with in terms of its own national, uh, natural environment. It's not a solution which you could use anywhere or transport anywhere else. It is Brazil in that natural environment which is using the resource of, 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 uh, of water in order uh, it to generate hydroelectric power. And that makes Brazil uh, currently using it overall 29% of, uh, of its total energy is renewable compared with a world average of 11. So Brazil is probably, you could argue, the world's green, greenest economy in, in many ways in terms of, 
in terms of energy. And the important thing about this is that all of this has been politically driven. This is not an outcome of market forces in any kind of natural sense. It's not a, a neoliberal process of marketization. It always has been questions of political strategy in terms of the development of, of innovation. Um, and this just shows the um, amount of bioethanol uh, through this period. So there was a steep uprise from 1975, a plateau, and then, uh, and then another steep uprise with the flex fuel vehicles. And that, uh, that, that is a, something which has uh, continued. So that deals with the, the, as it were, the energy side to it um, of, of, of the trilemma and the distinctiveness of Brazil in this. But the other really, really important uh, development that occurred, especially under the period of Cardozo and the Washington Consensus, so from 1985 to, to 2000, there was a very extensive deregulation in terms of its agriculture. And I suppose what I want to say here is that although all the kind of furore has been about biofuels and how risky they are in terms of land use change, what was really significant in terms of what drove land use change in Brazil was the development of the markets, the export markets, especially for food. So Brazil today is the largest exporter of poultry, red meat, coffee and sugar in the world. It's the second largest exporter of soya and soy oil, and the third largest exporter of, of, of corn. And in the period of, of uh, in the period of deregulation and the Washington Consensus, the, the area in the Mato Grosso, in the Cerrado, and also the Amazon was one in which there was huge amounts of, of, of conversion of non-agricultural land. Into, into agricultural land, both for, for, for cattle, for soya, and so on. And it was described as the arc of fire. And then, uh, effectively, because of the, essentially, understanding that the world market was becoming uh, very sensitized to this, the devastation that it was causing in Brazil, there emerged a number of initiatives in order to develop sustainable, sustainability sustainability regulation of one kind or another. So there were round tables for sustainable soy. Uh, there was a, a soy moratorium between the major, mostly American, uh, transnational producers, uh, uh, marketers of, of, uh, of, of, of Brazilian uh, uh, soy, where they were certified not to produce soy in any land that had been converted from uh, previously non-agricultural land for the production of soy. So there was a moratorium that was Im imposed. And all I want to talk about in this particular thing is not to say that it's either been successful or unsuccessful. There's a very mixed picture about this. But more that Brazil, in a way, uh, has been pioneering sustainability of regulation of food. And it's quite distinctive in doing that uh, it, on, on, on such a scale. There's been, if you compare it with Europe, there has been, there had been a lot of sustainability regulation about biofuels, but virtually none about food. So we, there isn't a kind of sustainability certification of, of, of food in, in, in that way. So this, in a way, is, is, is the, uh, the food horn of, of, of the dilemma. And in this, you can see crisis of land use change driven by global food uh, uh, food demand. There are crises of energy, which is from, energy, uh, from hydroelectric power, which involves also massive land use change, displacement of people, very controversial. And, and of course, all of this involves huge risks in terms of biodiversity, major new forms of, of GHG uh, emissions. But really what is important about this whole story, very schematically presented, is that there are, these have been distinctive political responses within the particular Brazilian challenges to climate change, to food, and, 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 and energy. And now it has taken a particular twist, which 
I think is probably one of the most important unheralded <coughs> geopolitical shifts that they have occurred over the past decade or so. And this is the emergence of the China-Brazil soya commodity complex. And very briefly, what, it, what this was driven by was that China was, became aware that in terms of its trilemma, it was becoming increasingly incapable of producing enough food within a, food, a narrow food security position of its, from its own territory. It just was not able to produce enough food for the growing food demand and the growing population in China. And this, of course, is with a population that has probably had one of the most stringent birth control policies in, in the world. That in spite of those measures of population control, land resources in China were, were becoming increasingly um, incapable of meeting the, the growth in food demand, the change and improvement in diets, but also the growth in, in demand. And as a consequence of that, uh, they, in, in, to, in the early 2000s, they, they suddenly took a political decision that they, weren't, that they were going to import soy. I mean, up until that point of view, there was very strict regulation of non-importation of, of soy and also corn or maize from, from, from abroad. And that, the, the, maize, the, maize, um, the maize regulation still, still obtains and is strongly protected by the state, so they are much more maize, maize uh, self-sufficient. But from that period, there, uh, in, this, uh, in the early 2000s, they suddenly started importing soy and predominantly from China. So you can see the proportion of total uh, uh, exports from Brazil from that period, over just that very short period, w most of it had been going to Europe, to Japan, but from that period on, it, now well over 50% of its total soy production goes to, to Brazil. And it, the consequences in Brazil is that the area harvested uh, rose from... Um, from 20 million hectares up to um, up to uh, up to 20 uh, sorry uh, 15 to uh, nearly 25 million hectares. So a massive increase in the amount of in the amount of uh, land that had been converted. So essentially, it was Chinese demand for soy bean meal for producing meat in in China that was driving the land conversion a very significant amount of the land conversion in, in Brazil. And you can see the, um, the amount of exports and the, and the, total, and the, and the total production of, of soy in Brazil. So this is a particular way where, example, where two trajectories, the Chinese trajectory encounters the Brazilian trajectory to produce what is a, a, a distinctive threat to uh, climate change. And... Uh, biodiversity and water uses and so on. So there was a, it's a major twist in the, um, in the, in the Brazilian story. And, and this just shows you the scale of it, really. I mean, this is an example of a China investing 7.5 million. They investing upstream to gain control as much as possible of their soybean sources and the just massive scale of upscaling of, of soybean production in, in Brazil. And this goes along with them being um, the, the largest exporter of poultry in the world. I mean, this is a, a very high-tech um, poultry, poultry uh, um, production unit in, in Brazil. And if anybody gets the chance, just, just put Brazilian Poultry Industry Association on your Google and have a look at, at the YouTube vi video of it. It is absolutely mind-blowing, I can assure you, just to see how, how, how the whole technology that they use, I mean, mind-blowing and scary as well. And, uh, uh, and, and this is an example of the beef production, which has now come under a WWF roundtable for sustainable beef. So this is Brazil certainly becoming a major source of land for production of food for the world, but at the same time, very tentatively developing sustainability regulation. Okay, so this is my final...
final slide, and I just want to sum up now. So what, what I've been trying to say is that we need to situate diverse economic trajectories in space and time. And I've tried to look at this in the very long perspective, uh, the not so long, where we're looking at the North European food, energy, climate trilemma, which drove the uh, Industrial Revolution, and then to a much shorter, uh, more contemporary history of, of Brazil. But we're looking in all of those cases at diverse economic trajectories in space and time. And in order to do that, we need to develop, as social scientists, a better understanding of the political dynamics of these socioeconomic trajectories. And it's very important to me to be, uh, to be doing this because, in, uh, as the Brazilian example has shown, it, the way that they are confronting the trilemma and the issues that are surrounding is very different from the way that a North America or a Europe or a, 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 a European country might. So we, we then understand, beginning under, to understand, if we look at it in this more social, sociogenic rather than anthropogenic perspective, where we're looking at the different dynamics of the three poles of the trilemma in the different natural environmental contexts and the political trajectories. And so they are responding in different ways to food demand and new competition uh, and the new competition for land. So just very briefly, the amount of land under cultivation and agricultural production in the US has actually been going down. So it hasn't been expanding, at the, while at the same time, the amount of land under cultivation in Brazil has been going up very rapidly. So that's the kind of very different responses and different dynamics in different areas. And, and we can see there's a big story here, and I know that you've got, people have got a big project about food security, that there's a really, in some senses, a, 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 a big sort of tension here between food, political drivers for food security on the one hand, and political drivers for, for climate change. So for example, when China took that decisive decision, sorry, that decision to, to no longer be self-sufficient in soy, but to, to start acquiring land in Africa and in Latin America to develop its food resources from elsewhere. It was, its, its energy security issue was almost running against its, its uh, climate change mitigation strategy. So these things are very, in, in, in political econ economic terms, very much um, in, 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 uh, in, in tension with each other. And finally, uh, um, I just want to end by emphasizing that, in fact, in spite of the huge emphasis that there has been on innovation being driven by market incentives and uh, has been a process of marketization, what has been very notable in, uh, in, in all of these strategic decisions is that the states, whether it's in the USA or in Europe or in China or in Brazil, the state has played a very, very significant way in shaping the, tra the direction of the tra trajectory. So in order to understand it, we really do need a, a, an understanding of the relation between politics and, 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 the, uh, in, in, and the economy. And it's for this reason, and I conclude here, that I think we really do need an, a better understanding of the sociogenesis of climate change as against the anthropogenesis of climate change. Thank you.